Thank you. Hi. Uh, yes, um, big green button, right? Let's see if this works. Uh, I'm going to talk about timing and synchronization in new network broadcast systems. And what the hell is that? Okay, hang on. So, about me first. Uh, I've been doing network stuff for a couple of years. I've never been to DK Norg, so this is my uh, premiere here. Uh, I've mostly learned things from more competent people around me. Uh, doesn't mean I'm competent. And there are giants on which shoulders we're standing. I would just like to acknowledge that. But this is an English presentation, and we'll stick to that. But I'm not a stupid Swede who doesn't understand Danish. Be, war be warned. <laughs> anyway, so let's d dive in. So what we're going to talk about first is the origins and needs of media synchronization. And the picture here is, this is a cathode ray tube, a fat TV for those who were born this uh, millennium. Uh, and it's the thing that basically is the origin of synchronization in media, with film frames as, as a strong runner-up. And the technical needs of the cathode ray tube, uh, how the electron gun draws the picture on the scope or on the cathode ray tube, is what governs uh, sync systems for media still today. So. If we just look at how we perceive images and sounds, uh, this is a very good illustration from a US Navy instruction film um, that's old enough that I can use the picture. And what you see, let's see if we can get a bit multimedia. Yeah, this is the sound. This is a linear representation of the waveform. These here, sorry, let's go back and Press the red, right button. These are moments in time. These are fixed moments in time that our eyes are and brain are making movies out of. This is a very important thing to understand for media synchronization. Now, of course, if we take and digitize the sound, we will also have moments in time in sound, but they will not be 24, 25, 29.93, if we are really perverted Americans, or 50 or 60 or 120 frames per second. They will be 48 kilohertz. And that is not Kelvin Hertz, Mr. Jugbeck. Uh, That's kilohertz. That's my. I, I did write kilo with uh, a big K there. Sorry. Anyway, so further, we need to ensure that sound and picture are in sync. Uh, we need to make sure that this... And, and we have a fairly small window. Uh, one frame, in which in uh, PAL land, which we are here, 50 hertz, is 20 milliseconds. And most people can find out within one or two frames if the sync is off, without training. And sensitized people are even better than that. And of course, the only way to achieve synchronization is to wait. You cannot speed the world up, not in real time. If, if you're cheating with files, of course, but that, that's not, that's not uh, the case here. Um, so there is a startup opportunity for the one who invents the earlification device. I've been waiting for 30 years. It's not here yet. Um, yeah, so screen revolution. Uh, the CRT, the fat TV, is a hipster, hipster thing. We don't need to steer the electron gun. It's basically, we take a blob of bytes representing pixels and throw them at the screen. Still at the frame rate, but it's just a blob of pictures. Or, or pi blob of pixels. Um, so we don't need to sync. We don't need this 50 hertz beat. Back, basically, analog sync is a black TV picture and nothing else. But it has the framework inside to say now. But we need a reference because we need to know where we are in time so that we can take sound picture, several pictures, merge them together and make the moment in time synchronization happen at the same time all through. 
So this means that we need to talk about when, not how frequently we took in a, a picture. Because if we have compression, we might have a still, that still might be valid for two hours. We don't need to re refresh the still every 20 milliseconds. It might be that yeah, this, this slide, for instance, is valid for several seconds, for instance. So we can, if we know the when, we can decide the offset. And we can tell the other media streams to wait and display this in synchronization. And this is valid for every digital trans transmission of video pictures, even if we're using BNC cables and SDI formats and so on and so forth. But we want to do this over TCP IP because Ethernet is so cheap and good, right? I used to run SDH. <laughs> anyway, so what, what this boils down to is that modern TV production is increasingly networked because the fact that we want to look at cat pictures and cat movies and that the bandwidth demands and the standardization onto Ethernet switches that actually also can look at an IP header, top of rack, 1U, pizza boxes, switches, routers, they're cheap. They're extremely cheap compared to what you get in a traditional media switching system, if you just look at the bandwidth. So, and, of course, the multiplexing abilities of TCP IP are quite astonishing when you're used to having to buy a new interface card when you go from progressive to interlaced, interlaced scanning. In RTP, which is what is used, being used the most, it's just a flag. Software-defined picture transmission. That's kind of nice. Of course, TCP IP is the Wild West. There is no timing, there is no control, and all the telco people are running around scared because there is no one who is in charge. Uh, especially on Ethernet. I mean, token ring, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> An SDH, yeah, clock. Anyway, so, what we do is that, of course, we use the multiplexion ability again. We have a service on the network, and this time it's I shouldn't say on, it's more embedded in, in strange ways. PTP, SEM SEMPTI and AES, who are the standards organizations for film and video and audio, respectively. Uh, they've decided to use IEEE 1588 2008, which is PTP version 2. Then there are infidels who are using PTP version 1, and of those we do not talk. That might include the mixing desk at the rear. Uh, I haven't looked too close. Anyway, so this is not your common usage of PTP. I mean, there are industrial uses for PTP that are pretty close to ours. You have automation, you have... <laughs> oh, we have pictures. Uh, you have automation, you have power system switching on time and so on and so forth. And you have uh, navigation stuff and so on. What we do care about not so much the offset to you to see, and we don't go to the International Bureau of Times and Measures and compare our Allen deviation every mo six months. Uh, that would a proper time not do. We don't. We just care about the timing island we have built to one microsecond, which I am quite proud is slightly, slightly narrower uh, than uh, 5G. 5G requires 1.5 microseconds. And, and, and there are indeed islands. The island is fairly small, and there are lots of rubber buffers. Think of the uh, large airplane full of tapes analogy, or TCP with buffering, 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 and delays between the islands. A lot of it. And of course, this being broadcast, there is a lot of cargo cult. There are lots of people who know perfectly well how traditional video works that don't have a even a shadow of an idea how, how we people actually transmit bytes between places. They are really, 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 really out in very deep waters. And the vendors, of course, they have found out this. So they learn just a little bit more. 
just a little, little bit more than the users. And then they find, oh yeah, let's package this and let's make it so it barely works. Put it on the show floor and sell it. So yeah, there's a lot of, lot of voodoo. Um, you can't have that if you want to buy for one, more than one vendor, or if you are, actually want to have something that works even when the vendor support is, huh? So, um, let's see here, button, button. Button. Which way do I point? Or is it just... Can, can you forward uh, move the slides for me? This is standing between you and your beer. <laughs> that is not a good thing. Okay. <laughs> Most likely a timing problem, yes. Okay, so I'm backing and going forth and going forth again. Yes. So, uh, a, bit, a bit, little bit of a word around standards. Uh, we've got AES67, which is the audio transmission standard. There's linear audio, CD quality, basically, but 48 instead of 44.1 kilohertz over multicast, RTP. Uh, video is pretty much the same thing. You take a video frame, uncompressed, and dump it into RTP and then throw it on the network using a time reference from PTP. So, so it's basically just IP multicast. It's, there are an, an interesting mix of fat and, and, and thin streams. Uh, the audio stream for a stereo pair is about 2.3 megabits. A uncompressed 1080p frame is about 3 gigabits, give or take. Um, so, so what you can say is the, the SEMPTE and AS67 standards are paywall versions of ITF standards, compilations. So you can mostly realize what they are by reading RFCs, but then you have the PTP standard and so on and so forth. So, um, as I said, RTP timestamps, headers, reference to common clock distributed by PTP. Same method for video and audio. And where it gets interesting, I've, I've chosen an example out of reality here, which is synchronous or synchronous choice for audio. Uh, and that's basically, do we, do we buffer weight to get in line? We can use the timing information in PTP to steer the sampling frequency only, and then take the sound as soon as we have it. Or we can take it and look at the timestamp and play it out in sync. And I have a few pictures here. The first slide version here had a Tintin picture up in the, in the left corner. I have to change the dictator here a bit um, because he has lots of microphones in front of me and that's why I chose him. Because you, what you have here is that you have two audio streams coming from the podium. They are being taken care of in uh, these two A analog to digital converters that make RTP and put them on the, on the network in the middle. And they are being transferred to the mixing desk over here via two network latencies. They're not very much different, these two latencies, but there are differences. And then we go to playback after having mixed the streams. So we have two microphones working together picking up the same sound, and that ends up in uh, the same playback. And now let's see if this PowerPoint is better than the other PowerPoint. Uh, this was supposed to be a movie. This is a Lisa Joux pattern from, from two tones on an oscilloscope. This is what happens when you have two unsynchronized streams. No lock between them. If we do synchronous, we have two, two tones. I am imagining that the dictator is just saying foul words, so this is roughly a one kilohertz tone, blocking his foul words out. Uh, and you have a latency between the two streams. If you, and this is if you only lock to the sampling frequency, if you actually look at the timestamps and align the samples synchronously, you will get to this. No, no. 
there is a bonus picture. Hey, this is Danish face difference. Everybody who's done, who's done the XY experiment on, on an oscilloscope recognizes this, and I call this Danish face difference, obviously. Uh, now, let's go further on. So the synchronous uh, picture is this. The singles are in phase. Actually, I cheated. This is only one tone, but it will look the same and it will sound the same. That's the important part. Um, the synchronous text label here is very, very cleverly placed over the on button here, so you can't see that the second input on the oscilloscope is actually off. <laughs> I've now uh, admitted as much. Anyway, further on. We want to build a timing infrastructure so that we can actually use this. And now we're coming to the network engineering part of this 15-minute warm-up. So what we had was a project at SVT to replace the legacy sync, the actual old box. So old that you would never ever dream of deploying or having something so old in your network, right? 15 years, I think. Uh, what we needed, and we had realized this fairly, fairly early on, very, very, very hands-on realization, that all forms of timing needs to be referenced to this common time frame. Um, it might be Black Burst, which is a black TV picture, Tri-Level, which is a modern digital sync, Word Clock, which is the digital sound sync, Sempty Clock, which is time, which actually looks like a clock with 50 frames per second, NTP, PTP, one impulse per minute, like in this clock here. Uh, all those need to be synchronized. So what we decided was, after some initial less uh, impressive tests, to make PTP king. But we still need all the other ones. We have 60 years old impulse clocks that we want to steer. So we, we, have, we have this time span or history of functions that we need to support. So what we did was we built a lab environment and then we did productions in it, including the largest remote production we've ever done. Uh, doing that in a lab environment is interesting, it's educating, and you very quickly learn what not to do. Uh, we first tried to build a synchronous island where we didn't talk to the old gear, that didn't work. We locked then to the legacy, that was quite Heath Robinson, which is, uh, now I don't remember the American equivalent of Heath Robinson, but Rube Goldberg, thank you. And we ran this for a year in production. I do not recommend this. Don't. Do it right from the, from the head on. So what we actually did when we did it right was to do something like this. We bought two GNSS steered clocks. Uh, you, need, you need to have a very good clock to start off with. You can buy P2P services um, if you want, at least in Sweden. But we decided that it would be less hassle to just buy two GNSS receivers with PTP output. And then we have, and they are very small in the picture because that's how I made the drawing, two switches, distribution switches. And then we have down here two sync generators. What they actually do is they listen to PTP and they output all the old stuff, except the one pulse per minute uh, stuff that's being abstracted over NTP on a separate path. And then there is a changeover unit because the legacy formats, they can't choose between two clocks. They need to have a clock. So you have a relay-based box that selects both between the two sync generators. And if one fa fails, it takes the other one and so on. Now, network-wise, PTP is not an ITF protocol, and you can tell. It's an level two and a half word, more. I, I, I really, really understood it when I started to look at it as SDH clock. You have a clock going into something and then it's being used to drive that device and then that device drives other things. Then there are transparent PTP switches, I don't like them. Um, so we do, because a lot of our gear requires a boundary mode, when you have a clock in, in the switch that actually reclocks and makes a new PTP clock. We run everything in boundary mode. 
and the distribution switches, let's see if we can go back, the little blue ones here, they run level three links to all consumers. So there is no routing through. It's just hop by hop. So PTP is hop by hop. It's very important to understand that. And yes, as I said, there is the theoretical possibility of it having a transparent or non-aware switch in this. Um, none of the good things do that for reason. Anyway, we need hardware support, of course. Uh, it's required. You cannot build this as you would a normal ITF protocol on, on a stupid switch. You need to have the hardware support in the device or it won't even get close to good enough. And of course in, it's uh, an IEEE protocol so it's full of options. The power people wanted their profile, the telco people wanted their profile, the, uh, the um, SEMPTI people wanted their profile and the audio people in AES wanted their profile. And they all differ. So you have to configure and there are parameters on how often you send messages and so on and so forth, and they have to be aligned over the link. There is no learning. You have to do it right. And the expensive switches can send more clocking packets per time unit per port, which is good because it makes for a better synchronization. And the cheaper ones can't. Um, so we need to follow on in what the hardware is available what kind of capabilities are available in the hardware. Uh, now, there are a few devices on the market that aren't sold as switches, but they actually work like that. And, and media converters, if you have to go from fiber to copper, there are very many of those that are Ethernet switches. Of course, there are only two port Ethernet switches, but they're still switches, which means that they buffer the frame and then when they sort of feel like throwing the frame out, they do it. Creating packet de delay variation. Jitter is something that only salespeople say. Um, and the other prime example is the divide by 10 OADM. When you have a 10 gigahertz wavelength, over Ethernet, and then you switch it down to 10 1 gigabit Ethernet uh, connections. That is timing wise a disaster. Don't buy those. Always buy the full frame, the, the full bandwidth of one channel. And then you can do 600 kilometers, no problem. I've done it from Stockholm up to Norland uh, in, in production. It works, no problem. Um, and, and if you're going to build this, you, need really, you really need to know a few things. You have to know what clock hierarchy you want. The grandmaster, the, the actual hardware with the antenna, that needs to be king, and it needs to be king all the time. This is a hierarchy, and you really need to enforce it. Uh, there are a bunch of things in the PTP system where you have the distance to the grandmaster clock and the quality of the clock that are influencing something that's called BMCA, Best Master Clock Algorithm, which is a selection process that runs pretty often, about once a second, I think it is, uh, where every PTP speaking divides, device decides if it's going to be king or slave. And that goes per PTP link, PTP enabled link it has. It can of, of course only be slave on one, it can't have two masters. And, and if you're going to build a multiple path, let's see if this is the right picture. Uh, yeah, so if, if you have a multiple path uh, scenario where you have several possible ways your PTP traffic could flow, you need to be able to decide which is the normal one and which is the failover path. And this is roughly how we've built the consumer needs does have two paths which it can receive the timing information over, but it needs to select only one. And you want this to be stable. Um, and of course, you, you, you can't buy uh, IP over MPLS or similar crap. You need wavelengths. Don't buy that crap. If you're selling it, 
start building it better. Uh, anyway, so and, and 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 then of course you have the priority thing. If you if you have a a lesser switch, you need to be able to put the PTP in the best queue possible, above everything else. Routing protocols are slow and non-demanding in comparison. PTP wins because it, it needs to have the best possible queuing of everything available. And don't use copper. The error correction in a copper transceiver adds PDV compared to the optical transceiver. So use optics even for short one gig runs. Um, and of course, I, I talked earlier about bubbles where where uh, we have one sync site there, one sync site there, and we want to run traffic between them. This is a work in progress. We don't know how we're going to do it. We are in a big project with our network vendor, and we've told them that we want to explore the design where we have clocks only in one town. And then we have backup clocks, because a few of our network devices have GPS receivers in, built in. So we can use them as a very cheap secondary source if we have failures. But the design idea is to always have the master clock in the main office first, and then only degrade to the local clock if we really, really need it. And the, the old design model for doing media is that you do TV in one house, and then you rent a connection to another house. And that rent might, of course, be picking up your phone and dialing the connection office and asking for a connection from A to B, most just like they did in the old days with the manual switchboards. Uh, we want to surpass that and have a globe country or company global media network where the user is king. Uh, or the user needs can be satisfied by the user himself or herself. So, and we do distribute our production system so much that we need this transparency. Well, let's work. This is a screenshot from one of our testing instruments. It's a fairly short run, it's just two hours if I remember right. And we have a timing error on a link here. It's about 250 nanoseconds for a fairly short fiber run. Uh, over this, we can get something like 10 to 15 nanoseconds precision. And with increasing radius of the network in terms of switch hops, we of course get the degradation, but we rarely go below 50 nanoseconds in lack of precision when we do say, five or six switch hops, if we do it right. It's sometimes uh, tearing your hair out hard to actually remember which parameter it was. Might be a case for uh, some kind of management deployment. I don't know. So basically, every frame of video you've seen from us, if you watch us, um, when I was a kid, I watched Danish TV, so I suppose that every Dane watches Swedish TV. Um, or did, when they were small at least. So since March 21, we've run PTP clocking as the main timing information source for every video frame we've made public. Yeah, that's it. Questions? Hello, Jordi from Tilia, Denmark. Um, I wanted to know more about, you mentioned that uh, if you have uh, two paths, so several paths to routers, you really need to define your primary. And then I was thinking, what if your uh, router is equally distanced to the both grandmaster signals that you have? How can you force that primary to have a stable signal? What you do is that you play with the priority parameter in the clock on the switch. So the first thing is that you need to decide that the grandmaster and the grandmaster candidate, the two GNSS, 
devices have the lowest priority setting, which means they are more important. Um, and they, they have the lowest priority setting of any device in the entire network, which means that they will be king as long as they are reachable. And then if you have a scenario where you have several paths, you need to actually decide this is going to be the good path, this is going to be the bad path, and you tweak the priority one and in some cases priority two on those devices so that you create a stable situation because BMCA doesn't does run, but it shouldn't come to a different conclusion unless the topology changed. Agree? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jan Krillisen, Norlys. Uh, my question goes about the situation where you cannot get something like VDM or dark fiber. Say, for instance, you have an OB truck uh, out doing uh, maybe a football match or a large concert production or something like that, where I would assume you have some kind of local synchronization between the different cameras, etc. Uh, but then you also have a link back to uh, the production facilities. Uh, that would probably be running over some kind of, of Ethernet. Uh, how do you manage the synchronization there? What you do, if, if you need PTP synchronization out there, you don't need it for everything all the time if you have leg legacy equipment. I mean, a lot of those productions are legacy equipment that have some kind of old synchronization and then you just submit the signal. But assuming that you want to have PTP synchronization out there, you can build a sync island with a local clock and then you can transmit that signal with the timestamps but without a PTP relation between sites and you can receive it and you can clock it to the house clock. It's possible to do that and most people who do build uh, distributed systems, do it that way. It means that you need to have some buffering on the path because you have, if, if, if it's a, a, a soft path, let's for instance say that it's an MPLS uh, service, you will have to have something that buffers for PDV, buffers for packet loss, which you really can't deal with, but actually mostly PDV. So you can do it, but, but you will get less less quality in terms of low delay. And, and that's a production problem rather than a distribution problem because if you have links, let's say comms links, people are talking across, uh, then latency will be a problem. If you're just delivering a finished program, 250 milliseconds of latency is not going to, to be a problem. Right. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any, anyone else? They want beer, <laughs> but we need to talk as well. <laughs> uh, hello, Thomas from TDCNet. Uh, I'm uh, curious, uh, how is your, um, uh, it seems like you used uh, GNNS, uh, maybe um, uh, GPS or whatever, mm. satellite system uh, for, for the um, primary clock. But what is, if, if that is um, disturbed for some reason, uh, jamming or whatever, uh, what's your holdover time? Uh, do I have any design criteria? And then uh, I was uh, interested in uh, if you can't uh, achieve that, uh, what's the consequence that the picture and sound will go out of sync? Or well, it's, well, it's, it it's break down? Yeah, I understand. Well, you, you, what we need to think about here is that, as I said earlier in the presentation, is that the actual accuracy to UTC is not as important as the fact that everything is going in lockstep in my island. So as long as I have a reasonably good holdover clock and I have organized oscillators in the, uh, in the GNSS uh, receivers and so on, so I have a fair amount of holdover there. I haven't tried this, but, but I also have two. And they are slightly moved apart and they are uh, also using a bunch of different GNSS systems. So I have a, a mix, which means that I will probably have at least one that's reasonably well working. On the other hand, on the other side of the street, we have the US Embassy. And, and we've seen GPS jamming, not only from Polish uh, trucks, but also from other people. 
because we had a precedent visit and there was completely havoc in GPS. So it, yes, it's a bit of risk. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious here as a follow-up question. If you say that accuracy to, this might be a dumb question because it's late in the day, but uh, you say that accuracy to UTC isn't that important to you. So why are you buying these GNSS uh, antennae in the first place? Basically because I want a clock that is very stable in terms of how long a second is. Ah, okay. So, so the ba basically I want a monotonically, boringly good clock. <laughs> that's that's the, the case. And if it's locked to UTC, all the better. But it's not critical. It's the... Yes, yes. That, it's, it's a very cheap way to get a good beat. I, I mean, I would love to have a cesium normal in my basement, but <laughs> who wouldn't? I mean, it's, it's completely normal. Oh, um, you mentioned you have... I'm Mikkel from South Uh You mentioned you have two of the, of the standards. Have you considered having three so you could actually figure out if one of them is broken? Yes, and we do. Okay. So yes, we, we are listening to several protocols at the same time. And anybody else? Please, thank you, Mons, very much. My talk. <laughs>